Programs and Corporate Relations here at the America Society Council of the Americas. It is my pleasure to welcome members of the ASCOA, special guests, friends, and those watching us through our webcast, which is sponsored by Telefonica. Thank you very much for joining us. It is an honor to have with us such a group of distinguished panelists. We have Paula Molina, anchor and editor of Radio Cooperativa and Neiman Fellow at Harvard 2012 to 2013. Gregory Elacqua, director of the Institute of Public Policy at the School of Economics at the University Diego Portales in Santiago. David Gallagher, chairman of ASET Chile and board member of the Chilean Public Studies Center, the CEP. Carl Meacham, Director of the Americas Program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, and Patricio Navia, Master Teacher of Liberal Studies Program, Latin American and Caribbean Studies at New York University, and a member of the Americas Quarterly Editorial Board. Tonight our panelists will be discussing Chile's upcoming elections, which have suddenly gotten even more interesting, and the prospects for economic growth, market competitiveness, and political and economic reforms in the coming years. The conversation will be moderated by Paula Molina, and following the discussion with the panelists, she will open the floor for questions from the audience. We look forward to a lively conversation. Again, thank you all for joining us, and thank you to the speakers for participating participating. Paula, I turn it over to you. Hello, welcome to you all. Um, I want to start this conversation today. I know that many of us are Chilean, some are not, but we are all very interested in this question, which is what is next for Chile? And in some way, this is a new question for Chile, or a question with new implications, I think. Because Chile has been a stable democracy with a permanent economic growth, for the last two decades. I read many times that Chile is considered a role model for Latin America. And actually, I was trying to find the source of the role model concept. And I discovered it was a CIA world fact book from the 90s, I think. But anyway, um, Chile has topped international rankings among Latin American countries in terms of competitiveness, economic freedom, and security. Chilean levels of perceived corruption in public sector are the lowest in the region with Uruguay. Poverty has fallen since 1990 from 40% to around 14, 11%. Um, unemployment is uh, at records low. But Chile's recent history shows the creation of bipartisan long-term policies regarding institution building, macroeconomics, and respect to the rule of law. Chile is the only South American country in the OECD. But in 2006, we saw a first wave of a student protest, and in 2011, the world was surprised with a series of massive marches in the street, with Chilean students demanding for a radical change in the educational education system. And it is true that most Chileans don't approve the violence that emerged in those protests, but it is also true that a majority supports their students' demands for a change. Environmental protests became common, and protests in general became common in Chile. I remember before coming to the States how a group of workers, they were waiting for the public transportation. This is people who wake up every morning at 5 a.m., 6 a.m., and suddenly they thought that it was not fair to wait for hours and hours for the public transport, so they occupy the street. So protests became very common. It wasn't just one winter of discontent. A student protest resumed just some weeks ago with 100,000 people marked. Yesterday, the Central Unitaria de Trabajadores, the Workers' Central Union, organized another march. And marches matter. Uh, as I've been learning this year in Harvard, one of the lessons of Latin American politics is that social demands and street marches and protests matter. And that politicians and society as a whole need to deal with them in order to restore social peace and basic, and basic political consensus. Ignoring social movements or underestimating them 
or repressing them doesn't seem like the right recipe. But Chileans are not only protesting, their levels of political identification fell in the last years. Only political scientists like political parties, we all know that, but as far as we know, democracies were, work better when political parties are strong and people expect to be represented by them. And Chileans today have low expectations from their political parties. <coughs> so some say Chile is having a problem of success. Middle class expanded and it has more sophisticated demands. Chile is giving the battle of the middle income trap, uh, as the Chilean finance minister, finance, finance minister said. Some say inequality lies at the root of the problem. Chile's economy is expected to grow, but inequality remains high. And in one of the most unequal regions in the world, Chile inequality is slightly above the average Latin American standard. Some say it's a problem of democracy. They say our present constitution is not consistent with a society that has left behind the political agreements that frame the transition to democracy, and that now new social sectors expect to be represented. There may be other explanations for Chilean discontent, and I think that we'll address some of them. And, but it is important to know what's going on in Chile to understand what is next for the country. And what is next is a presidential election in November. And it will be Chile's first presidential election with an automatic voter registration and non-mandatory voting. The opposition candidate, Michelle Bachelet, already said she wants a tax reform and to study a new constitution. The governing coalition lost this week one of its presidential pre-candidates, Lawrence Gorborn, but he was promptly replaced by a much more experienced politician, former economy minister Pablo Longueira who said that the opposition can only offer misery, demagoguery, and populist proposals. And there are also independent candidates who are uh, struggling to get to the vote. So as you can see, what is next for Chile is a very interesting question. And maybe not only for Chileans. Um, in a wider sense, it may also be a question about the future of a country that play by the rules, that embraced a free market-oriented economy and tried to manage an auspicious business climate with progressive social policies. Maybe the question about what is next for Chile goes beyond the immediate future for our country and might tell us also something about the ways to achieve sustained economic growth, shared prosperity, and social progress for all. I thank you so much for your attention, and now I would like to introduce the rest of the panelists. So we would like to start listening to Carl Mitchum. Is, he is director in cent for the Center for Strategic and International Studies, America's program. Mitchum is a native speaker of Spanish and was partly, partly raised in Chile, his mother's country of origin. His understanding of U.S. policy and politics towards Latin American countries is one of his specialities. Welcome, Carl. Thank you, thank you. Um, I, 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 you can hear me, right? Okay, great, great. Um, well, I'm, I'm really happy to be on this uh, panel with such illustrious names um, to talk about uh, really what I believe is, is not a, uh, a boring country. When I, when I was talking with some folks before we started here, you know, they made the comment that Chile is, is just a country that, that, you know, you have a small group of folks that follow it because, you know, it's not one of those countries that, that gets a lot of attention because bad things aren't really happening there. You know, it's not Venezuela, it's not Cuba, it's not Argentina with the problems that are occurring there. It's a country where, in general, things work. But I would say uh, to you that, uh, you know, this is a country of contradictions. This is a country uh, that is uh, full of uh, um, contrasts. And um, I think for a lot of folks uh, in Chile, it's very difficult sort of to have this discussion. So I'm going to put my Chile credentials out there first. Uh, having been raised in Chile, having a Chilean mother, growing up uh, in a place uh, called Mayoa in San Fernando in the south of Chile, I think I have the credentials in order to criticize my half country. Um, so I, I'm, I'm going to say, uh, you know, 
what are these contradictions? What, what, what are these contrasts? On, on the one hand, you have a country that economically is doing excellent. If you look at Chile on paper, and I, and I have some of these statistics, I mean, unemployment has decreased. I mean, it's, it's at its lowest uh, uh, that it's been in about six years. Now it's at 6.1%. 6 6 uh, inflation will, in, uh, will increase to about 3% this year, but it's still within the range that the central bank uh, was counting on. Uh, for this period, uh, gross domestic product is rising, 5% uh, in 2013. Uh, y you have these statistics here that say that you know, this is a country that's doing well. Uh, on the other hand, you have these protests, these protests that, have, that uh, started, uh, I guess, at, towards the tail end of, of President Bachelet's administration with the pinguinos, with the kids in the street demanding um, a better, I guess, more access to education, the issue of, uh, uh, of a publicly funded education system what was, is what was um, raised during those times. Most recently, you've had some difficulties along those lines. I think anybody who becomes Secretary of, uh, of Education in Chile, uh, I don't know if that's, a, if that's a good thing or if that's sort of the end of your career. Um, and it's, a it's a tough one, right. And you had Secretary Bayer being kicked out now of, of his position uh, for different reasons, even though this was a, a figure in Chile who had been participating in this discussion, who had been uh, a member of numerous panels uh, with the previous government, uh, but that was just forced out. And a lot of folks think that that is an effort by uh, the Concertación to sort of show with evidence that, you know, they speak with the voice that the students feel. I mean, there's an example right there. Listen, we're just like you is what maybe is what they're trying to say. So, you know, this is something that, that is interesting and I think is a little jazzy or sexy as far as what's happening in, in Chile. Most of the kids that are out there protesting and a lot of uh, my uh, family, my cousins, these are kids that were raised post Pinochet. They, they don't have the same point of reference that a lot of the folks that are actually in government right now have. Uh, they, they have other demands and even though I think they feel that in Chile things are much better uh, compared to the Pinochet years, you have the same social stratification that you've had for a very long time in Chile. And the questions that you still have in Chile, and I'm sure a lot of you have been to Chile or, or, or uh, conversant about Chilean issues, but the same three questions uh, that were relevant when I was living in Chile are the same ones that are relevant today when you talk to someone. You ask them where do you live, you ask them what your last name is, and you ask them where did you go to school. And that tells you what kind of Chilean you are. That's still the same today. So people are not very happy with the lack of social mobility. Uh, I think people have more stuff, but are they able to realize this sort of Chilean dream and be able to you know, go through every part of Chilean society? No. And I think you're seeing the students express that view uh, with the protests through the education uh, issue, but I think it's coming up through, uh, through other things as well, as was noted, the issue of the Constitution and the constitutional reform, some of the budgetary issues. Um, so I'm not going to make my, my uh, remarks uh, super long, but I just want to say that this is a problem that any administration is going to have. I think that the administration uh, of uh, President Bachelet, who's most likely to, to be the president now, even though I think that Mr. Longueda is probably the best candidate that the Alliance for Chile could have come up with to compete with her. Uh, it's going to be a tough race, and whoever wins is going to have an even tougher time than what they've had in the past. So who really wants to be Ch president of Chile with the situation that's going to be dealt to him or her uh, after this election? That, that's the real issue here. You have to unite the country. There's expectations that are super, super, super big that President Bachelet uh, or former President Bachelet has talked about uh, that President Longueira would have to deal with if he's elected. Uh, Ms. Ms. Bachelet will have to deal with the demands of the, uh, of the students. Uh, Camila and Mr. Jackson are still out there and they're going to be pushing even harder because now they want to be, pu they want to be elected officials as well, I think with, with Camila. Uh, so, you know, how is that situation going to evolve? Um, and we're going to attempt, I guess, all four of us, as well as you, <laughs> are going to attempt to answer some of these questions during this, uh, during this panel and uh, I look forward to your questions as well. Thanks. Thank you, Carl. Sure. I would like to um, introduce uh, David Gallagher, who is chairman of Asset Chile, a Santiago-based boutique investment bank covering Latin America. 
board member of the Chilean Public Studies Center and um, a columnist for El Mercurio newspaper. David is also on the board of Senco Sud, Chilean retail company with a strong presence in Brazil, Colombia, Peru, and Argentina. He, he is on the board of the Chilean Council of Foreign Relations. Welcome, David. Thanks, Paula. Well, where is Chile going? Where is it heading? Um, I think that, um, you know, as Carl Meacham said, the country is doing very well. The, the, the economy has been absolutely fantastic the last four years, and the government have been particularly clever at administering the economy. The, uh, for the first time in quite a long time, uh, fiscal expenditures have uh, risen below the, the, r the rate of growth of GDP. Um, the, um, the sovereign, um, <coughs> the sovereign f uh, funds, offshore funds, um, which had gone down to about um, 12 billion in 2009 and now back to about 28 uh, billion. So the government itself has, has, has really done very, very well, and yet it has, um, as, as, as you know, a very low approval rating. The, the, pre the president has an approval rating somewhere in the 30s. The uh, economic management itself, although people recognize that the economy is doing well, they find it, it is badly managed. So, so, so what, is hap uh, what is happening? I mean, I think it's a, a question that, that, that everybody's asking. I think that, that Chile, um, over the last, um, over its history, was a country which was extremely hierarchical. And um, you know, I think Carl um, 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 mentioned uh, the, you know, there's quite a rigid uh, class system, but I th it's a country where people were for, for, for ages, and it's not just the effect of the Pinochet dictatorship, excessively differential. Uh, to their superiors, young people to old people, uh, workers to their bosses. And suddenly, at some time, I think it started with the Lagos government, it, it um, increased with the Bachelet government, and it increased even more with the P Piñera government, people started to rebel against this excess hierarchy in Chilean society. And I think that that rebellion is a very healthy one myself. I mean, I think that um, it, it was needed. I think people, people felt that, um, that Chile was run behind closed doors by, by elites. And in fact, it was. And, and it probably was even during the, the Marxist government of um, Salvador Allende. Um, and uh, the, there's an elite in the Concertacion and an elite in the, in the government party. That, um, in the Lagos government, for instance, and you know, I'm not saying whether it's good or bad, but it, it, the, the, there were summit meetings all the time between business and, and the president and his ministers, and, and, and um, they were deciding the future of, of the country. And uh, the, the business asso association took, took Lagos up. Uh, a whole list of policy um, goals, which was called the uh, the growth agenda, and um, it was all very cozy. And in the meantime, you had an electoral system, which um, is is very very strange. I mean, I always say that one of the reasons, uh, one of the proofs of that it's a very strange electoral system, that it's almost impossible to explain to a foreigner how it actually works. I mean, it really takes a very long time, and don't worry, I'm not going to attempt to do so now. <laughs> but um, basically, um, one candidate from each uh, coalition gets elected, and that candidate is chosen behind closed doors um, uh, by, by, by the party bosses. Now, there was a great opportunity, and um, I don't want to preempt uh, Patricia, who wrote a wonderful column about it this morning. But there was a great opportunity to, to um, to at least um, <coughs> produce a palliative to that uh, very closed um, electoral system by having primaries. And, and yesterday, uh, May the 1st, by midnight, uh, the parties had to register where they were going to have primaries for, for parliamentary seats. And every party except for one, Renovación Nacional, uh, finally uh, decided not to have primaries at all. So there's uh, one opportunity that, that the um, the, the parties had to at least uh, uh, give some opportunity to, to the much invoked citizens to, to, to choose their candidates was, uh, was lost. 
So um, the other thing is that, you know, in, over the last few years, the, the elites have been caught uh, by, um, by the Chilean public with, with their pants down. I mean, really, uh, on, on many, many occasions. There was a tremendous um, scandal when uh, drug stores were found to be colluding on prices. Then there was uh, La Polar, which is a retail company which uh, committed unbelievable fraud um, in, a, in a sort of um, Ponzi scheme to, um, um, uh, which, um, which is really quite scandal, uh, scandalous. And, and you know there have been more and more cases of this kind, and and um, and, th and that obviously means that that, that, that people, you know, no, no longer feel the awed respect for for, for, for the elites which they, they had felt um, or, 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 or had been silent about at least in 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 the, in the past. So there is a sort of revolution. You also have uh, a much freer press, and the reason for that is uh, because. The two big um, written media groups face a competition of electronic media, which um, uh, are doing an enormous amount of investigative journalism of very high quality. And it is absolutely impossible for the two main newspapers, not in the end, even though they try to delay, uh, not in the end to take up the stories that come out in the electronic media. So. Um, so there's a great deal more information about what's going on in the country. But careful, um, I think that none of this means that Chile want a, a, a Maoist revolution or something. I mean, the, really, um, this, this, this new democratization of the, of the Chilean citizens, citizenry is not going in a direction, in a radical direction. They want, they want to have a say, people want to have a say, they want they want more, more equality than they feel less inclined to be deferential. But there's a vast majority of, of Chileans who really uh, believe in the uh, economic model, free market model. And um, you know, it's true that the students uh, bring out 150,000 uh, people uh, onto the street, but uh, when the Cosanera Center shopping mall was inaugurated last year, there were 250,000 people. So, um, you know, when Lady Gaga arrives or, or, or Justin Bieber arrives in Chile, um, there are um, as many people uh, go, to, go to, to the concert as can actually fit in the Estadio Nacional, which unfortunately is only 80,000 people, otherwise there'd be many more. And so, careful, I think that, um, you, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not so sure that, that I agree that, 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 that the candidates have to take up uh, all the student demands. I mean, I think the, um, and I'm not sure I agree with Paula that the students today have a big majority support. Um, there was a, a SEP poll about a year ago in which uh, Chileans were asked to, to express how confident they were in a whole lot of institutions. Practically every institution came out very, very badly with the exception, curiously, of the police, um, the armed forces, and, and radio stations. But the students only had a 30% confidence rating, which is actually slightly below the rather depreciated Catholic Church. And um, so, you know, the stu students say they, 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 they represent what they call, and it's a, a word very hard to translate in, into English, la ciudadanía, the citizenry. But in fact, I think they, they are not, um, um, uh, they, 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 their demands are not shared by a majority of Chil Chilean. But, um, you know, there, there could be a, a, a Greek tragedy here in which um, all candidates feel they have to um, kowtow to, to uh, student demands in Chile. Uh, in, in the end gets driven to, 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 to policies which are not sought by the majority. I hope that doesn't happen. Thank you, David, for your remarks and your comments. Uh, about the majority of support, I think it's, it, it depends on the question. But if you ask today if we need a change in our education policies, I think majority of people would say, yes, we do. It doesn't mean that, we, that the students will say exactly what to do, but we can, we can go back to this this issue also. Yeah. I would like to introduce Gregory Elagba, who is an expert on education. She is, he is director of the Public Policy Institute at the School of Economics at Universidad Diego Portales in Chile, 
former senior advisor to the Chilean Minister of Education between 2003 and 2006. LACA has consulted with the World Bank and a number of foundations and national governments and education policies. Welcome, Gregory. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's, uh, it's an honor to be on such a distinguished panel. Um, I, one thing I just want to start by saying, um, just listening and hearing about, I, I live in Chile, I'm American actually, just listening, uh, reading the newspaper in Chile um, every day is exhausting, I find. <laughs> There's so much going on. Every day there's so much change. Just listening to all of the things that everybody just said, I'm, you know, it's, it's, it's sometimes a bit almost, almost overwhelming and exhausting. I think it's a fascinating place to live and work in public policy, but it's also a little bit exhausting. I'm, I, I don't know if, you, if everybody here agrees with me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, but it's a very it's a very dynamic place, and a lot a lot is going on. Though I do agree I do agree with Carl that uh, those three questions, unfortunately, still still seem to be seem to be un, uh, very important. And social mobility, you know, and studies uh, corroborate that as well. I'm going to focus my remarks on education, which is a, an issue I feel um, I've, I've I've spent quite a deal of, of time thinking about and, and writing about in Chile. Um, and I'm, but I'm going to focus my, my remarks on a little known fact that outside of education circles, um, which is Chile's impressive progress in primary and secondary school. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk a little bit about this and, 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 and focus on what I believe to be the factors that explain some of this progress. And I think that some of these link to some of the other issues that you have all talked about and probably Pato will address, uh, will address as well. Um, I, I, I don't know if, uh, if many of you have seen this study, but a recent very influential study by uh, Stanford economist Rick Hanushek, um, a political scientist uh, at, uh, at Harvard, Paul Peterson, and an economist at uh, the University of Munich, Logar Vosman. Uh, they recently conducted a study that provides estimates on learning gains in, uh, over the last 14 years from countries in the OECD and a number of developing countries. And Chile placed second out of 49 countries in annual growth in student achievement, uh, which, is, which, is, which is really a spectacular, uh, I think, outcome. They improved at an annual rate of about the equivalent of what would be over 14 years, 2.5 years of, of, of learning. Uh, uh, improvements in learning. And this is compared to, if you look at the US, which has also had kind of slower growth rates, about one year of learning. Um, and in some other countries like Colombia, Brazil, which has been on, on average about two years of learning. Chile was number two after Latvia um, in, 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 these, in this, with this outcome. There's, there's declines reported in another, a number of other countries. Um, now these results, weren't really surprising to those of us who work in education because they're consistent with the s steady increases in the national test and the CIMSE, our national standardized tests in math, language, and other subjects in fourth, eighth, and tenth grade show similar trends. So those of us who work in education weren't surprised, but those of you know, people who don't, don't work in education were very surprised, especially given you know, the unwavering student protests um, the, as Paola mentioned, in you know, a survey, the polling that indicates that Chileans would like to change education pol policies, um, and um, and and just the student movements in general. We had a, a major student movement, high school student movement, in 2006, the Revolución de los Pingüinos, which was very important. And then we have the student movement, uh, the, the university student movement, over the last over the last three years. So many people were surprised with these results. So I'm going to just talk briefly about what I think um, are the factors that likely explain these very impressive learning gains. Um, and I think I'll touch some of the factors that I that I'm going to suggest will touch on many of the issues that you're talking about. One, the first has to any those of us who work in education know that. The most important explanatory factor that explains achievement or, or learning improvements has to do with the home, has to do with socioeconomic environments. So the first factor uh, is, I would argue, is a higher standard of living in Chile. Some of you have mentioned some, some indicators. I'll mention a few more. Uh, a second factor is increased consistent uh, investment in education. And finally, uh, uh, improved incentives. 
which I'll talk less about because it's le less interesting, but I think it's also very important. So in the discussion after, I'm happy to talk about it. Let's remember Chile in the 1990s, when, the, when these economists started looking at, uh, was, the, was the first point of reference. Chile's GDP capita was about $5,500, and Chile was ranked sixth in Latin America, right around the same as Peru in, in the early 90s. About half of Chileans lived above, uh, below the poverty line, and about 20% lived in extreme poverty, and only half of students, high school students, graduated from high school, and only about 14% went on to study in higher education. Education expenditures were extremely low, about $360 per student a year. Public spending in education was very low, about 2.4% of GDP. This is compared to, for example, 5% in the US, 5.5% 5 in the Netherlands, and most other OECD countries around 5 Inadequate dis incentives, I won't talk too much about this, but we had a, an unfettered uh, voucher program, unregulated, with poorly designed that was designed in the early 80s. Basically, the government provided a flat per pupil voucher per, uh, to schools that wasn't differentiated by socioeconomic status, and there was no very little quality regulation. So they gave it to schools, and they didn't ask any, for anything in return. Very little information, very little regu lax regulation, no accountability, no incentives for teachers to do any better, no, no, no merit pay, no teacher evaluations, a very poorly uh, designed system. This was in the early 90s. Now, what happens, what's happened over the last 15 years? And I think that this, this explains a lot of the outcomes, but, but one, of the, one of the outcomes that I, that I look at in my own research is education. First, uh, just a higher standard of living. Today, GDP per capita in Chile is about 15,300. So it's increased almost threefold since the early 90s. And Chile is ranked first in the region now. In, in the early 90s, it was ranked sixth. Poverty, cut poverty rate by about two-thirds. The, the, the most recent indicators are depend on, depends on what, which, which uh, method you use, of course. But it's about 14% of Chileans live under the poverty line. Basically eradicated extreme poverty. It was 20% in the early 1990s. High school graduation rates were about 50% in the early 90s. Today they're almost 90%, which is higher than France, higher than your average OECD country. Uh, about 50% of Chileans go to college. Remember, it was 14% in the early 1990s. We had, uh, in, in the early 90s, 180,000 students enrolled in an institution of higher education. Today, we have over a million students, so it's about half. Similar as coverage rates as, as the OECD. So young students today are, have similar levels of education as their peers in OECD students. Their parents have similar levels of education as their peers in Latin America. So there's a, a, a large generation gap with, with, uh, with education. Increased education investments is, a, is a, another important factor. Annual per student expenditure increased fourfold since the early 1990s, from about $500 per student to $2,000 today. Also, public and private uh, investment as a percentage of uh, GDP also doubled since 1990. So it was, like I mentioned, about 2.4% in 1990. Today, we're almost at OECD levels, which is about four, close to 5%. We're about 4.5%. And private expenditures also in education about uh, uh, almost doubled. Uh, increased schooling inputs, we can talk more about this. Almost all, st in, the, in the 90s, most schools had double shifts. Today, almost all students go to school in a full day school program, jornada escolar completa. Teacher salaries have increased by about 200% in real terms. Uh, student, <laughs> student computer ratio declined from 80 to less than 10 per student. Dozens of targeted programs, lots of investments in, in direct investments in poor schools, compensatory programs in poor schools. Um, and, and some of these programs had rigorous evaluations. Most of them didn't, but those that did shows that show that most of them did have some effects. And improved incentives, we introduced an, a differentiated voucher. So now schools receive about 60% more money per poor, per pure, poor student. So school, we have a targeted voucher program that recognizes that you need to give schools adequate funding to educate low, low SES students. It's not flat. We have testing every year, fourth, eighth, tenth grade, 
widely disseminated scores, schools are held accountable for their outcomes, so we have a national accountability system in place. Uh, we have teacher accountability, merit pay, we have teacher public school teacher evaluation programs. So we've had higher standard of living, I, argue, I would argue that higher standard of living, increased uh, investments in education, and improved incentives probably likely explain this gap. But I want to just end my, my remarks by saying that, and I think this is also a positive note, this is part of our challenges. Um, most of the growth, most of the learning gains in Chile, and, we're at the bottom. So Chile uh, about reduced their what's called a, in, in education, we call a test score gap, an achievement test score gap, by almost a half a standard deviation, which is a huge reduction and narrowing of the test score gap in language and about a third in math. And Chile is the country that made the most progress out of all of the countries that participated in PISA in 2000 and 2009 in reducing the test score, the national test score gap between the, 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 the wealthiest students and the poorest students. Unfortunately, and getting back to uh, one of the things that Carl mentioned, um, we have uh, the, 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 the wealthier students um, have stagnant scores. So most of the, the improvements have been at the bottom. The wealthier students who stand, send their kids to you know, elite private schools uh, in Chile, spend a lot of money to send their kids to elite private schools in Chile, have very mediocre scores. Uh, compared to their peers in OECD countries. On average, a middle class student that goes to a public school in an OECD uh, country outperforms elite uh, upper, upper SES students in, in Chile. So just to, to end, I just want to just end on a couple, a couple ideas about, uh, about challenges. One is, uh, of course, we've made lots of gains in quality but we're still lagging behind most other countries in the OECD. On, on, on all of these international tests, we're still in the bottom five, 10 percent uh, out of all the countries that compete. We've improved the most and we've made a lot of progress, but we're still at the bottom. Uh, very low quality teachers. Um, in a recent test, Chile participated in a, in a, a, a competency content knowledge test of 16 countries. Chile was number 15 out of 16. Uh, very far behind in content knowledge. So teacher quality is very, very low in Chile, and, and, that's, and that's reflected in, in national competency test as well. And of course, there's the complex challenge, which I didn't even mention, uh, challenges in higher education. High costs. The cost of one student for a middle class family costs about 40% of their income. Very high cost for, in higher education, a similar problem we have here in the US. Very high debt burden. Chilean uh, graduates pay about three to five times higher proportion of their earnings to pay off their student loans than, than their peers in OECD countries. Uh, we have high dropout rates in college, over 50%. Some major programs, the first year, 25% uh, 20, of students drop out. So we have very high inefficiency, high dropout rates, it's very inefficient, and lack, lacks quality control, which is one of the reasons that the, the most recent uh, Minister of Education was impeached for, for not monitoring, um, the argument wasn't, he, he wasn't monitoring the, the um, quality, which may be fair or not fair, we can talk about that, but, um, but that's the, that was the, the reason. But I would just end that on a positive note that I think the sense of urgency, or I would say mixed, and I agree with what David said as well. Um, there is a sense of urgency in the country, which Paola mentioned in her, ta her, her remarks, that to, you know, Chileans want to continue to improve the quality of their education and services in general and other, in other areas. Um, you know, we had the protests in 2006, the protests today, there's kind of a sense of urgency that we haven't improved enough. We need to continue to improve our quality, which is a positive thing. What concerns me is, is one thing that you mentioned, is that some of their demands may not have the intended co consequences of, of continuing in the, in, the, in the path that we're going, which is improving the quality of the system. For example, free higher education. Chile has very low, one thing I didn't mention, another important challenge is we have very low coverage in preschool education uh, compared to even Latin American countries. Low quality, low coverage. Low, low female participation rates as well. Um, that's one, may, maybe one of the, 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 the reasons why we have, continue to have low female uh, labor participation. So free higher education when we, haven't even, when we do not even have uh, coverage 
is, is questionable. And banning for profit as well, that's another issue we could talk about. 30% of our students in K-12 and primary and secondary attend for-profit subsidized schools. If we ban for-profit schooling, what are we going to do with one million students? Uh, it's not clear. And in higher education, of course, we have lax regulation, but it's, it's unclear how we're going to ban for-profit in the vocational technical schooling, which is about 50% of current first-year enrollments. And most of, over two-thirds of higher education vocational schools technical institutions are for profit. So it's not clear to me that profit's the problem. And I'm pretty clear that free higher education's not the, not the right, right policy today. Okay, thank you, Gregory. Thank you. Um, we'll keep talking about education, which is at the core of this, of this what's next for Chile. So I want to introduce Patricia Nadia, who is Master Teacher of Liberal Studies Program, Latin American and Caribbean Studies in New York University. He's a regular columnist for Chilean newspapers. Welcome, Pat. Thank you. Um, so, um, you should think about the presidential election in Chile as you think about when you go to see the next uh, Mission Impossible film. Um, so, um, and you will be on the verge of your seats, but you know what the end will be, right? So there isn't really a surprise as to what the end result will be. So it is fascinating, it's very interesting. Um, but it's, it's not going to be a recent. And that's largely because of um, what has happened in Chile in the past um, 24 years now since democracy was restored and, and, and the way um, Chilean institutions have, um, have worked. So I want to focus my remarks on three things. Um, first, on the issue of um, discontent. Um, then I want to talk a little bit about the middle income trap, where Chile finds itself now. And third, on um, the political reforms and the institutional challenges um, Chile now faces. So on this end, the, there might be marches, but, um, and there might be people at, at the mall on weekends. So normally what we do is we poll. So we know what people actually think and what they, um, what they feel. Um, because, you know, if you go by Sukhothi Park, you're going to think that 99% of Americans wanted to overthrow uh, the system. And it turned out that um, it just, they just weren't there. Um, and if you only go to the mall, you are also going to have a truncated sample as to what happens there. Well, as it turns out, when we look at polls, and this is true for the Centro de Estudios Públicos polls that um, SEP conducts um, three times a year, and it's also true in all polls. I mean, you just look, find your poll, and you get pretty much the same results. And, and that is that Chileans are, for the most part, moderate. The, the, the distribution in terms of scale in Chile, it's a very normal distribution. About 60% of Chileans place themselves within four and six on a one to 10 scale. So they are moderate. Um, thus, if you are a presidential candidate or happen to advise any presidential candidate, remind them that that's where the votes are. So you can, on primaries, move to the ex extremes. But on the general election, you're going to have to win with um, a moderate message. And that's how the five presidents that have served in Chile since democracy was restored um, have won. So I'm not telling you anything new. This is a well-known recipe for success, and it is the one that will explain why whomever wins in November uh, will win. So if Michel Bachelet keeps on moving to the left, uh, then somebody else will step in and win those moderate voters. Um, I know it's, for many people this is hard to believe, but that's what the numbers um, tell us, and that's what has happened. So I'm, I'm friends with a couple of the presidential candidates, and I tell them that that's where the votes are. Uh, and they say, well, but, but let's move into the left. And, and the answer is, well, that's an opportunity for you, because it means that somebody will um, get that support from moderate voters. My expectation is that Bachelet will eventually realize that and she will have to move back to the center. It's going to be a little bit tough for her to sort of undo some of the promises that she has made so far. But um, it is always, a, or the economy is always a good excuse, right? So I intended to uh, have a new constitution, but the economic situation has now dramatically changed. And thus, I will have to put that um, on the back burner for, for a few more years. So 
the notion of discontent is just not there. What the numbers do tell us is that people want inclusion. So they see that there is a carnival going on in Chile, they want in. They want to be invited in, and the marches, the protests, are about inclusion. They are not about changing the roadmap. They are about sort of perhaps the um, crew that will take us there. They are tired with uh, the same people that have been leading the country for the past 24 years, um, but they don't want to change the roadmap. They do want to keep on going in the same direction. They want more rights. They want more opportunities. Um, but they certainly don't want to go back to any other um, promised land uh, than, the ones they, than the one they are looking at um, um, right now. So that's the reason why when you compare Chile with other Latin American countries, um, you don't see the kind of sort of Bolivarian dream being um, sort of having any sort of popularity. People say, well, don't tell me about a Bolivarian promised land. The promised land is right there. I see it build bridges so that I can uh, move there. And education is the bridge that people want to have built in order to, um, to get there. The second point has to do with the notion of the middle income trap. And with all due respect to Alejandro Foxley, Chile's probably most prominent finance minister, um, a definition of a trap requires that somebody gets caught in it. Um, so the, the, this is a middle income trap story. Countries develop to a certain level, and when they get to that level, the demands are so high that they somehow fall into this trap, and they can no longer develop. The, interestingly enough, the examples that are used to highlight the middle income trap are um, Australia, New Zealand, and Finland countries that developed and thus more than a trap is really a middle income step. You get there and it might take you a while to get to the next step um, but uh, most countries do it. In fact there is one outlier and we can have a whole seminar for that outlier and that's the case of Argentina but we don't even want to get there um, for a number of different reasons but a trap is not a trap. It doesn't trap anyone. And, and the middle income trap has not trapped anyone. Chile is at a point of development where it faces different challenges than it did before. And um, those challenges, challenges must be addressed. And I totally agree with Gregory and, and, and David in terms of the way you address those challenges will facilitate or hinder your um, future development. But um, having that kind of a challenge ahead is much better than um, having other challenges like reducing poverty or um, increasing educational coverage. Talking about quality is much better than talking about um, um, coverage. So you can think about the challenges Chile faces um, the same way you think about um, your own health after you get the results from your annual checkup. Um, your cholesterol level was exactly the same the day before you got your results, but somehow when the numbers come in and they tell you that you have high cholesterol, you start feeling bad. But it's a good feeling bad um, um, feeling um, precisely because you, you have the opportunity to do something about it. Um, Chile is not like, um, or it's not in the position as many other Latin American countries, find themselves in the emergency room with some real problems, like um, heart attacks. I mean, Chile has some um, chest pain, and it must address um, those problems. Um, I think Gregory talked about the educational challenges very well. Um, but we don't have to do open heart surgery, because what we have is chest pain. And thus, we have to sort of do gradual and pragmatic fixes rather than um, over, um, overdo it in terms of the, um, the treatment. The third point I want to highlight has to do with um, political reforms and institutions. And that's what I think um, Chile's biggest challenge uh, lies ahead. So um, it turns out that the constitution we have is really Pinochet's constitution that has been amended and fixed, but it lacks democratic legitimacy. I don't know if that if that is a problem that one can solve, um, you can think of 
examples of constitutions that lack initial democracy like the U.S. Constitution, but they gain legitimacy through the exercise of... Um, so perhaps we can continue with Pinochet's Constitution and just reform it and fix it and fix institutions in such a way that they can um, better respond to the needs the country has um, today. When we ask Chileans whether they value democracy, they do. And they value democracy now more than they did five years ago and more than 10 and 20 years ago. So we're on the right path. Uh, when we ask whether they value politicians, they don't. But when we ask them about specific politicians, they tend to value them more. So I don't like politicians as a group, but my mayor, my deputy, my minister, I like very much. So we have to be careful as to how we interpret the rejection of the political class um, as opposed to the rejection of politicians. Um, and that's, I think, an important point that, um, again, we can pick up from um, all the polls that are conducted in Chile. We certainly have some issues of institutional reform, the electoral system. It's, it's a complicated system, but it's really a proportional representation system with magnitude two, which means that it's the least proportional of all proportional representation systems, which is kind of uh, tricky. Um, but for all practical matters, it means that it creates a duopoly with very little competition. So the absence of competition in the electoral system in Chile is probably what generates the kind of um, um, negative reaction towards um, politicians. And the decision not to hold primaries underlines the notion that the system is not sufficiently competitive. So if you get nominated by your coalition, you have a 50% chance of winning the seat. Um, but now um, the coalitions decided that they weren't even going to open that component up to, um, for people to choose who the candidate there will be primaries on presidential nominees, but that's largely because the concertación is certain that Michel Bachelet will win. So it's really a primary to ratify Michel Bachelet as the um, concertación presidential nominee, not a primary for people to choose who will or to select who will be their um, candidate. And on the Alianza side, the Alianza also moved away from um, holding primaries, except Renovación Nacional that is holding primaries in 10 districts out of the 60 districts. So Renovación Nacional is doing this little, and it looks as the most democratic party in, in Chile today. And it is, but simply by doing very, very um, little. But the, uh, the Alianza has chosen, in my view, not to hold or to hold presidential primaries um, the way it will um, in order to secure because of the incentives of the electoral system, a third of the vote in the um, November election, I think they have pretty much given up on winning the presidential election, and they simply want to secure half of the seats in the chamber and the Senate, and thus exercise a veto power in order to prevent a sort of more to the left, Michel Bachelet um, second government from um, promulgating a number of the reforms that she now seeks to promulgate. Now, as we move closer to the election, what we will see, in my view, is um, a race to the center. The candidates will quickly move towards uh, the median voter because that's the voter that will decide the election. There is one small caveat, and that caveat is that now we have uh, voluntary voting. And what happens with voluntary voting is that candidates might, rather than win your vote and win the votes of the moderate, they might scare those votes away. So you do negative campaigning not to win anyone. You know that with negative campaigning, no one gets convinced. Um, so Barack Obama voted to kill children. Uh, you don't convince anyone with that kind of negative campaigning. But what you do is you scare moderates away. And so by scaring moderates away, you can win with your hard electoral base, and that can give you a majority because the moderates are not voting. And that's exactly what happened in the municipal elections um, that, that Chile just held in 2012. And it's 
what happened in midterm elections in the United States every, um, every four years as well. <coughs> because only the hard, sort of the hard base votes, um, the candidates move farther away from the median voter. That might be a problem in Chile. Um, we still have to see how things um, will um, turn out. But the need to reform political institutions and make them more inclusive, make them more accountable, it's non, I mean, doesn't speak of an immediate crisis, but it does point to a potential crisis in the future. Nothing will happen to Chile next year, probably nothing will happen to Chile in the next two or three years. But if those institutions are not fixed in a gradual, pragmatic way, then Chile might potentially have a problem. And I want to end with um, what I always end with when I talk about Chile um, today. And that is a reference to my first Latin American politics class when I was an undergrad many, many years ago. <coughs> so um, we learned that the most stable democracy in Latin America was that of Venezuela. And Venezuela was very stable <coughs> for a number of reasons, but it only had three problems. Um, the first problem was that um, it had a high dependence on oil, one commodity that represented most of Venezuela's exports. The second problem is that the country was highly unequal, very, very high levels of inequality. And the third problem is that there were two political parties that kind of split power among them without much competition. Those of you who are familiar with Chile, those are three problems that will sound uh, familiar to you. Then in the late 80s, Venezuela adopted voluntary voting, <laughs> dropping the old system of mandatory voting. OK, so that's what I wanted to end with. Um, I don't think Chile is on the same path as Venezuela, but it should certainly be concerned that if they don't do gradual, pragmatic reforms in the future, uh, we may end up there. On that note, Patricia <laughs> 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 Stavsky's presentation. Uh, I really thank you. You have a very interesting perspectives and you have contributed to this conversation in, in many different ways. But I think there is something in common, in common and I would like to make just a couple of questions before opening to the public. But there is something in common in, your, in you and it is this idea of a lack of social mobility in Chile, an inclusion that is taking too long, that the old questions about your school, your neighborhood, your last name it still matters. And I think you all consider, consider it. And I would like to know why. Why is it taking too long? I would like to ask, start asking you, David. Uh, <clears throat> well, I think that with this, um, this sort of demo, what I call democratic revolution that has been um, uh, in, in the streets, in the, in, in, in the press, I mean, um, uh, a lot is changing, but, but um, I think that, that um, to make Chile a more inclusive society, you, you, you need several things. I mean, I think that um, the, 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 education, um, the education system has to improve. I mean, I think that, um, you know, I agree that the education system in Chile has, uh, has improved a lot, I mean, over the, over the last uh, 20, 30 years, but the, 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 the educational system is still not as inclusive as it should be. And I think that uh, in the uh, preschool education, which Gregory mentioned towards the end of his talk, Chile is very far behind. There was an article in the, <coughs> in the New York Times, I think on Sunday, um, with the ironic title, No Rich Kid is Left Behind, or something like that. And, and, um, and really it was about how um, rich people in the United States invest a huge amount of money on, on, um, on preschool. And, um, and, and, the, and the problem in, in um, and so, you know, I, mean, I think that, that in, in, the, in the student demands, the students are asking for, um, for free education and, they, and, and, they're, and they're also uh, denouncing that, that any education should be for profit. I mean, those are the two big themes of, of, um, of the students and not really about quality. And they don't, um, they don't talk about preschool education at all because uh, toddlers don't march, they just toddle. And, and they, um, they, they don't, <laughs> so you know, I mean, that, and that's really, where, that's really where the emphasis, I mean, you know, if we're, we're gonna make Chile more, a more equal society with more equal opportunities, 
then um, then that's uh, that's where where we have to start. Um, I think there's an enormous amount of consciousness now about um, about this topic, and there are also uh, quite a lot of um, uh, economists uh, who are more sort of center right or very pro free market. Um, in Chile and and worldwide, and you know worldwide, I'm thinking of of that book uh, published last year by Asimoglu and Robinson, who um, you know showing that that uh, inequality is very bad business because um, uh, most talents get get wasted because uh, the social instability is a result of it, and uh, so it impairs investment, and and so even. Even, even sort of right of center uh, economists have, 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 have come to realize that, 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 that this is a very big, um, very big challenge. And I think that um, I think it will be addressed. And, uh, and you know, I mean, I think um, uh, I agree with, um, with with Patricio. I mean, you know, the, um, I think that that the, the way future, is, the way to the the, the future is is. Um, is reforms, not not revolution. That's what what uh, the Chileans want, and and, um, and and I think that that that's what will happen over the next um, the next mobility, decade. The next decade, but social mobility is taking time because of a history that you mentioned, the history of yes. the country, and basically because of education. So Chilean education so far has failed in in giving that that social mobility. I don't know if you agree, Gregory, what, which is, where is the reason? Which I, is mean, the I, reason? I, I think about two examples um, <clears throat> that are stri were striking to me. I have a, I have a, 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 a colleague uh, who is a professor in an economics department in the United States. He's Chilean. Uh, he did his PhD in economics at Harvard. Uh, and he wanted to go back to Chile. And, and you know, he was considering maybe either going to the private sector or working at a university. Actually, we were trying to recruit him. Um, and he's a very talented young economist, and he was telling me about going one of his interviews in, um, at, at, a, at a, a private company in I don't remember which. I probably wouldn't say anywhere if I did, <laughs> in case somebody here who works at the company, <laughs> probably not. Um, and the, the, one of the first questions in the interview was, um, "Where did you go to high school?" And he said, he, because I don't see it on your resume here, you know, I, I don't understand, you're applying for this position, I, I need to know, you know, wh wh where's your high school? He said, well, I'm, I'm in a prestigious, right, currently I'm a, you know, t tenure track professor at a department of economics at a prestigious university in the United States, I did my PhD at Harvard, you know, I published in top journals, I'm a very smart guy, why does it matter? Um, and you know this is very common still. You know, going back to your your three questions, um, how do you change that? I'm not sure. Um, I, I think that's a, that that's something that's that's very complicated. You know, if we look at some of the there was a there was a study years ago um, by the, our university at the the law the law law school. They conducted a survey of law schools and um, um, they found that you know law schools still hired. Based on more on you know socio, so, uh, SES or, or your last name or where you're from or your high school were more important factors than than your the the the, the law school that you studied at. Uh, Javier Nunez is an economist mm -hmm. at uh, at the University of Chile. Found that um, he looked at earnings of uh, students, business students at the University of Chile, and found that students from low ES, low SES families who were ranked in the top of their class earned, I don't remember how much less, but a su substantially less than <laughs> high SES students who went to private schools. Low SES students who went to public schools earned substantially less than high SES students who went to private schools ranked at the bottom of their class. So this is a real challenge. I'm not, I think we've made lots of progress. You know, As I mentioned, some of the statistics we, we mentioned, seven out of 10 students currently enrolled in a university are the first <coughs> <coughs> generation of their family to study at, in college. This is great progress, but I don't know how to change these other kind of. I don't want to use the word cultural, but these these other these other um, practices. So um, and it's super it's follow clear. quick up, and I'm not being the voice of the students here. Please don't criticize <laughs> me. I just want to say, don't you have a better social mobility when most of the students share are going together to public school? And it, it's just a question, <laughs> but. Isn't that 
that happens here in the States. No, 90% of the students go to public schools. My kids are attending a public schools and they are going with kids who have lower incomes than mine or higher incomes than mine. Isn't it, maybe, is, could it, I mean, could it is, be that that could be I mean, there a is, way? There is evidence that, sorry, I'm gonna, I might have to pass the microphone in a minute because I'm, I'm coughing a little bit, but there is some evidence um, that you know, integration <coughs> That does have long-term effects on students. When you're with students or with people from different socioeconomic classes in the classroom, you're more empathetic to those students. I mean, it happens with religion, it happens with social class, happens with race. Um, you, you, you tend to have more empathy and you tend to, I mean, it, it, they can have long-term effects maybe on hiring practices and, and these kinds of things if you know people from different, back, with different backgrounds um, social backgrounds, religious backgrounds, racial backgrounds, et cetera, ethnic backgrounds. Um, there is evidence on this. Um, but I, you know, again, how are we going to, I mean, do you send your children to public schools in Chile? No, I don't. And I'm, uh, neither do I. Yes, but <laughs> my, just a very small comment, but the dream of my mother was to send me to a private school because she knew that was my only way to achieve a higher That's education. Right. Of course. And I went to a public school. And my dream for my kids is that they could go to a public school to, to be raised with kids from different religions, different incomes, different worlds. Well, and Ch let, let's remember also one way maybe to move, we're moving in that direction. Um, currently a student, you send your child to a private school in Chile and you pay a, probably close to $1,000 a month. A student, you know, a public school student gets a subsidy of about Hundred and fifty dollars a month. Right, right, right. No, no. And, so and, you know, I mean, that and makes as you a said, big difference. And as you said, the results <coughs> for private schools in Chile are not very good, neither. Which is another discussion. I'd like to ask you, Patricio, and, and then to Carl, what do you think about this? Uh, why inclusion is taking too long in Chile? Because it seems that this is at the core of, of the problem. Yeah, but I, I don't know if it's um, if it's taking too long. I mean. It's certainly taking long, but uh, we don't really have a model as to how this should happen, okay. right? So <clears throat> saying that it's taking too long, it's really uh, measuring against what we would like um, for it to, to do. There is but certainly- It is a question, uh, but do you think it's taking too long? I wish it, it would go faster, um, but, but I think it's moving in the, in the right direction. I mean, it's, Sure, I would like for it to happen faster, and I think that an, a number of reforms could um, sort of push it in that direction. Um, but I think there have been some reforms that are moving in that um, the, that are moving the country in, in that direction. What I'm afraid of, though, is that um, some of the demands and some of the reforms that these social movements, another term for social movement is interest group. I mean, one of the demands for the social movements, be it the students or the National Rifle Association, is um, are just the wrong demands. They they are trying to solve a problem, but they are not going to solve that problem. I, I don't think you should treat students as if they are the experts on what the right policies are. I mean, when you go to the doctor, the doctor works with you but you are the patient. You, you are not the one to say what the treatment for your disease is. Uh, you might sort of help in finding the right way to implement the treatment, but you can't go to the doctor and the doctor tells you, well, I don't know, you have a, a small tumor. And you can't quite say, I don't think so. Um, I, I, if you do, you, you are not really going to solve your problem, right? So I, I would be much more careful about that idea that people who participate in the solution find a better solution. That's not necessarily uh, the case um, all the time. And I wouldn't idealize social movement. Uh, I think one of the problems, and that's partly the responsibility of those of us who are in mass media in Chile too, is that we sort of assume we give social movements a blank check as if they have a legitimacy that they don't necessarily have. I mean, if you had one billion dollars, one additional billion dollars in Chile, would you spend that on free university education or perhaps on cancer patients? And there will be a cancer march on Saturday in Santiago. It, it oh, makes no, sense. Of course, right? you right. have to treat interested groups according to their right. interests. That, that's totally. Uh, but I was wondering about uh, social inclusion and, uh, and social mobility in Chile. And uh, you mentioned there are some 
um, some measures in the right direction, and I would like to know which one are those. Well, there's been a significant educational reform um, since 1990. Um, Poverty has been reduced dramatically. I mean, the quality of the education children now get is much better than what they got um, 20 years ago. Part of the problems we have when we do polls is that we, what normally happens is that people with lower levels of education tend to vote less. But when you run regressions in Chile, you get the opposite um, the opposite regression, which doesn't make any sense. But what really happens is that people with less than eight years of education in Chile are all 60 or older. So um, you don't have young people with very low levels of education. So you, your, uh, your uh, sample is always um, skewed. So I would say I, I definitely think the country's moving in the right direction. There are a number of other things that could be done. Um, certainly public transportation would facilitate things. Um, spending on the quality of housing, um, particularly in the comunas that are near downtown Santiago but have historically been low-income comunas um, would improve the situation much more. But then again, those I think are second order solutions to um, that we can now implement simply because we have been successful at, at doing the other, um, the other things. Mm -hmm. uh, Carl, your answer? Sure. I, I mean, I think there's a lot, of, uh, a lot to be mentioned here. Um, I, I would be interested in polling uh, with the millennials, with the Chilean millennials. Um, I think they, they probably don't fit in to some of the categories that have been mentioned about moderation. I think Chile has been, uh, is a very sort of balanced place, you know, you don't find too many extremes in general uh, with Chilean culture, but I think the millennials are a little different. And I think the demands that the millennials have uh, are a little more um, enthusiastic. Uh, you mentioned a lot of statistics insofar as how things have improved. The millennials are saying, look, look at all the changes that have occurred, I want mine. Uh, and I think we're confusing a little bit equal outcome with equal opportunity. Um, I think many folks don't feel that they have the opportunity to compete. Uh, and you mentioned the example of, of, of the Chilean college professor that's at Harvard and is going back to Chile for a job and they're still asking him why he went to high school. I mean, these are social issues that and attitudes that need to be changed in Chile that really, I mean, when is it going to happen? Is it every 40 years that you seem to be having these el tira y afloje famous that happens in Chile that you, the push and pull, you know, last one was 71, 73, you know, are we due for another sort of push? I don't think it'll be, I agree with Patricio that I don't think that it's the kind of thing that we saw before, but I do definitely see that this is a little different. The, the demands that these kids have are a little different. And, and I would be careful with saying, with alluding or sort of insinuating that their movement isn't legitimate. I think they are legitimate in that they're expressing a viewpoint in Chile that a lot of folks agree with. They might not have the right outcomes. I think they lost a lot of credibility with a lot of opportunities that they could have had with the government to actually make some changes in education that they didn't uh, take advantage of. But, you know, you still have the same issues in Chile. I mean, the issue of the famous pituto, when you're looking for, <laughs> when you're looking for jobs. I mean, the people that help you get a job, the person that's helping you get into certain situations to get the jobs, those things still exist in Chile. And how long, these kids are asking, how long do I have to wait for things to, uh, to sort of open up and for me to be able to compete the way that I should, based on my qualifications. Um, Patricio, you know, he tries to answer this. This is a tough question to answer. I mean, but may maybe things will keep on going the way that they are, and you'll keep on having protests and protests. You mentioned the Venezuelan case. I hope Chile doesn't go into that situation, and you have sort of a, well, you, you all know what happened in 92 in, in, in Venezuela, El Caracaso. Uh, and then things progressed into, into getting to, to Mr. Chavez. But um, I really, again, I, I think the issue of the youth in Chile, this millennial group, is really different than what we've seen in the past. And I, I think it's something to watch. I, I think they won't determine 
uh, who the president is, but they're going to have an effect in the debate in a very clear way. And maybe they just won't participate, which will make it like what, what Patricia said, you know, like, um, like the famous movie, um, where we know what the outcome will be, but we'll all be sitting on the edge of our seats. But if it doesn't happen now, it's due to happen in the next, well, in the short term is what my view is. Uh, so um, my views might be a little different than, than the folks that are here on the panel. <laughs> then again, on that note, I would like to open it for questions from you and the audience. I think I will still have a little bit, like a couple of minutes, so we're going to take at least a couple of questions. Please. We've been discussing about education. Which other subjects do you think? Question, please. We've been talking about education. Which other subjects do you think will be relevant for this election? Whoever yeah, wants to take that answer? Well, I think uh, Patricia said that, that um, y you know, the, 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 the elections are won in the center, and I think, I think that, I mean, you're absolutely certain that's true, um, but I think that, that, that sometimes candidates um, go to the very end getting, getting too much off center. I mean, I personally think that Frey won the lo lost the last elections because he was too far to the left. And, um, you know, provided there is a candidate who is perceived to be in the center, like, like uh, Piñera was at that, at that point, um, the guy who goes too, too far in one direction is, is, is going to lose. Now, certainly, um, Michel Bachelet is, is, um, is, is proposing some very, very controversial issues, and which, which are really quite, um, quite left-leading. I mean, it's a, it's a very left-wing campaign. She arrived in Chile um, a few weeks ago. Everybody said that she was actually not going to commit herself to anything at all, just listen. And, and quite the contrary, and probably because people have been saying that, uh, she started making announcements every day. And I think that, that for instance, one, one, um, one area which uh, Patricio mentioned, which, uh, which, 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 which is going to be an issue, is, is the question of the Constitution. And I think that um, you know, Michelle Bachelet has actually gone so far as to say that she doesn't, that there has to be a new constitution. She, she hasn't, uh, instead of saying that the constitution has to be changed, she say, she's saying there has to be a new constitution. And, um, and she's also um, not excluded uh, there being a constitutional assembly, which, um, w w which, which sounds to a lot of people who get you know, scared easily, and, and um, uh, it sounds um, going the path of Venezuela, Ecuador, Bolivia, and, and uh, you know, countries who've gone gone down that route. Now, you know, the, 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 there are two diametrically different uh, views of what constitutions are supposed to do. Um, the, the classical liberal view of a constitution is that the constitution should actually constrain um, the uh, the passions of, of the of, of the passing majority, and that, the, that there should be checks and balances, and and, um, and and there is a Bolivarian view, which is that the constitution should actually strengthen the majority um, and not not constrain it at all, and and um, and, and when um, when uh, Bachelet calls for a constitutional or, or doesn't exclude a constitutional assembly, people start worrying about um, about that kind of thing. In a country where there is a constitution which has the legitim legitimacy problems, which um, which Patricio mentioned, and where there are exaggerated supermajority rules, I mean there, there are it is a, it is a very cons it is an exaggeratedly constraining constitution. But do you go from there to, to uh, a constitution which just bolsters the majority rather than constrain it? And th that, that, that's a big question. And it may, it may um, I think it's a question that has started to, to emerge. Um, I think um, the, the, the rest will be the sort of usual stuff. There will be some, uh, some competition for populist um, offerings. Um, Bachelet has already um, offered a 40,000 uh, bonus for, for, for about 60% of the population every March. 
um, a 250,000 peso minimum wage, which is a 25% increase on the, on, the, on the current one. Um, you know, there'll be that, that, that kind of stuff, but that, that, that will be, there'll be nothing new there, and, 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 and Chile is no different from, from, from other countries in that sense. I, I, I think that the constitution is, is, a, is a very sore issue in Chile. Now, that, that, that's one which I think is going to be important. I don't know if uh, anyone else would like to address that question. If would you would like to move to other questions from the audience? To I think energy is an issue that the Chileans need to talk about. Um, the, the issue of either I send is super important. Um, maybe it's not one of the cent central issues, but most of Chile's energy is, is gotten from foreign resources. This is not sustainable. Uh, this is an infrastructural issue that the Chileans have to deal with. And, uh, their neighbors aren't really supplying them with energy and they have difficulties with their neighbors. So, uh, you know, the ability of Chile to be able to produce, to be self-sufficient and produce its own energy uh, is something that I think probably will come up. I mean, they've rejected time after time efforts to, uh, to, to deal with some of their energy demands with domestic resources for one issue, for one reason or another. Uh, that's a pending issue that has a, a, a massive, uh, uh, massive importance in Chile's ability to compete uh, and to keep on producing and to be this uh, very effective and high-performing economy that it is and could be doing even more. So I would say energy uh, should be one of the issues it's dealt with in addition to social mobility, constitutional reform, and, and some of the education reform that we chatted about. Gregory? I just want to say that <clears throat> I'm actually um, excited that <laughs> that the candidates are moving to the right and to the left because that means probably that we're really going to have primaries. And usually, you know, in any in any election cycle, what happens is to mobilize and energize the base of voters in your parties, you have to move either to the left or the right, and then you move to the center for the general election. So if that's really what we're seeing. I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic that we're going to have real primaries. Um, so I think, that's, I think that, could be, that could be a good thing. Of course, I also hope that the candidates in the general election move to the center because Frey, you know, some research suggests that Frey, I think your, some of your work has also suggested that Frey, you know, his left wing positions um, were, were, not, were not popular. Um, I also, and I was just thinking another very important issue that. Um, you know, we don't. When we only have the municipal elections um, to help us, to help guide us a little bit about what to expect, uh, anticipate. But we had a thirty. Was it a thirty-eight percent turnout in the municipal elections? A very low voter turnout. Um, and so we're assuming that the youth, the millennials, are going to turn out to vote. I don't know if that's going to happen. Um, but I, I think that the candidates, uh, the the a lot of the old mayors, uh, the very successful mayors. Um, lost a couple of a couple of mayors, for the example, the mayor of Providencia, surprisingly lost his election because he didn't do anything to turn out the vote. All of the old voters in his comuna stayed home. So there's a, there's a real challenge for candidates, for presidential candidates now, to be able to mobilize voters, not just convince them of their policies, their platforms, but also to make sure that, to get them to, turn, to go out and vote. I'm not sure that they're they're, they're doing that or if they're really thinking about that because in the municipal elections, most of them forgot about it or just didn't, didn't take it into account in their, in their local campaigns. And there were surprises. Uh, and they were very surprised. You know, some of them were very surprised. They lost. So another question? Thank you. Um, I was actually going to ask a question in regarding to energy, uh, so I'm glad you brought that up. Um, I actually work in the energy industry, and I think that energy is very important, um, energy independence um, for faster growth for our country, and then focusing um, all the efforts in the other areas, like education. Um, so I was wondering if you could also comment on um, how this relates to what is the outlook uh, on energy um, and energy independence in um, Chile in regards to renewable or clean energy, um, and also how this relates to the different political parties um, and their take on this, and how would the election also affect what um, comes as a result as for what it is energy independence? Who wants to add this <coughs> let, me, let me start. <coughs> so, um, if, the, if we're going to take the millennials seriously, then Idraizan will never be built, right? Okay. Then, 
it, it's kind of interesting. The polls we do at the Universidad Diego Portales, we wanted to include what question, one question, and, and we wanted to ask people what, what were the names of the rivers that would be affected by Idraizen. But the question just didn't work in the, in the test um, section because no one knew. Um, so we couldn't even ask the question because when we tried in, in the small foc uh, focus groups, uh, no one had any idea what the names of the rivers uh, would be. But people are opposed to Idraizen. But they are um, opposed to Idraizen mostly because of the notion of lucro, of profit. So, um, and, and this is um, sort of, comes from, from for-profit education. So people have the perception that profit, profiteering in, in the case of, or excessive profit in the case of the US is, um, is bad. And that's, um, you should not allow it. So if Codelco were to build Hydroisen, um, it would be okay because it would be a state um, company, right? So people are concerned about the environment, but if Codelco pollutes and children die in small towns because of that pollution, those kids are heroes because they died for the country. Um, I, I, I'm not making this up. I mean, the, it did, well, we couldn't. We couldn't do it because no one. Um, no, people no, support no, Codelco. Disclosure. People disclosure. support disclosure. Codelco disclosure. on a number of issues. We ask people if they sort of whether Codelco should produce less copper if um, if it pollutes. People are not concerned with Codelco pollution. I mean, the case of La Greda, this um, elementary school near one of Codelco's um, refineries, is a clear case. I mean, these people are dying. But because it's Codelco, it's not that big of a deal because there is no lucro. Well, so what about um, like displacement of like the people that live there, like the villages and everything around where Hydraisen will be built? Well, in people in Aysen are in favor of Hydraisen for the most part, e either because they were bought off by the company or because they believe that there will be more economic opportunities, whatever. But the large majority of people in Aysen are in favor of Hydraisen. It is the people in the rest of Chile who are against Hydroisen. And they are against Hydroisen because they are really against private companies making a profit out of the destruction of the environment. Um, but this doesn't mean that Chileans are pro-environment. If they were, they wouldn't be polluting as much, or they would be marching against pollution in Santiago, which they don't do, right? So it's not really that they are in favor of the environment. We just don't have that kind of electorate yet. Um, they are really against private companies making a profit, and that will probably derail Idraizen for the time being. And politicians already know this, and that's why they are sort of offering a solution that will get the state, the public sector involved in um, generating an energy solution um, in the future. Chileans are in general in favor of the state, even though they prefer not to go through state services, they prefer the state to offer those services because they believe those services or private companies will be kept at check um, if there are uh, public companies competing uh, with them. That's the case of Banco Estado, the state bank. People are totally in favor of Banco Estado, but they don't have their bank accounts there. Can I, can I just <laughs> add to what, what Patricio is saying? Uh, because I think there's, a, um, there's a, a, another connection to what he's saying as well. So they don't want the private companies to profit off of doing Bidraisen or whatever because there's a social aspect to this as well. The same people that run the private companies are in, are the, so, are the elites that they don't want to see profit from these things. That, that's just, it goes sort of to the root of some of the conflict that we're talking about with education, some of the societal issues that exist in Chile. So w when you look at a lot of these issues, if you don't include the social sort of optic to it, uh, you, you sort of miss what's, what, what's going on. And, and uh, I think Patricio mentioned it very well. I mean, the attitude is don't make a profit off it. Don't make a profit off of education. Don't make a profit off of uh, energy because we know who's getting the money. Let the state do it. The state is, is, is something that we trust more than these folks uh, that are going to profit off of it that are in these elites. Okay, we just have time for one more question. So, oh, I'm so sorry. Um, thanks for the comment. It's very insightful. Um, <coughs> provided you already know the end of the political context, what are the 
key changes that we're going to see in economic policy in Chile five years on the road now. Who wants to address that? <laughs> well, it, it depends who wins elections, I guess. But I mean, I think that um, if um, when when uh, when Patricio said that the, the elections were like Mission Impossible, I thought that he th he thought the um, it was definite who was going to win the elections, and then I realized that he wasn't a hundred percent. He wasn't going there exactly. Um, I, I mean, it's highly likely that uh, Bachelet will win the elections, but I don't think it's. Um, it's a given. But I mean, if she wins the elections, I think there's been, um, I think the idea is to, um, to do a tax reform. And, and um, I mean, basically, I don't think there will be a, a very radical change in economic policy, save that there will be more um, redistribution via tax, via income tax. And um, and, and, and obviously using the money um, taken from those who can afford to pay, um, used for, for social programs, education, and so on. So I think that that, that will be a change. I, th I think the economy will continue to be completely an open economy, and basically a market economy. There's already been, I think under the Piñera government, there's probably been greater uh, a, a, gr a greater move to, to consumer protection than there's been ever before. So, so I mean, I don't think that, that, that I think it's the Piñera government that has made the change there, and, and I think that, that that will continue. I mean, I think that there, there, are, um, there are three or four uh, key slogan words now in Chile, and, and one of them, apart from lucro, which uh, Patricio mentioned, is abuso. And um, people, um, People are tired of abusos, and um, abuso means um, what uh, Lawrence Goldburn, the ca candidate who had to step down, did when he was general manager of Senko Sud, which was to increase uh, the commission on on, um, on the credit cards of of, of, of of the company unilaterally, that kind of thing. Well. Um, so I, I, I think a change in the tax system is a big thing. I think the, 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 if, if Bachelet wins also, I think for the reasons that uh, Patricio mentioned, that people like there to be a state company in, in various sectors. Uh, there could be a state uh, pension fund to compete with the private sector pension funds. Private sector pension funds are very opposed to that, but I don't think it's the end of the world, frankly. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised, I mean, and, and uh, that could even happen with the right of center government, if, if in fact the state bought part of Idraisen to solve the, um, the problems that Patricio mentioned. Um, but I, 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 think, I think that um, the, the, there will be um, a greater emphasis if, if probably whoever wins, you know, on the, on the, on the question of um, inequality, because I think that, that that's a, a crying issue. I mean, I think that, uh, you know, it's a, it's, it's a social issue, it's a private sector issue. I mean, I couldn't um, agree more uh, with Gregory that the, the, the recruitment policy of, of, of companies um, is appalling, but it, but it but it is changing, uh, believe me, and actually multinationals are very different from Chilean companies. If you go to, um, to, to um, the offices of BHP or, or uh, you know, one of those mi foreign mining companies, Nestlé, doesn't matter, you, know, you think you're in a different company, a country than if you go uh, to a Chilean company. Because if you go to a Chilean company, everybody comes from one of four schools, and um, high schools. And, and, um, Whereas uh, you know, foreign companies don't have that, that kind of recruitment policy, and that will have a demonstration effect over time. I mean, fortunately, despite all the barking and all the um, apparently polarized posturing, there isn't a great deal of difference in the, in the economic policies of, um, <coughs> of the two sides. Thank you, David. I, I'd like to Please, add Patricia. Just, just one thing. Um, so if Bachelet wins, as is likely to happen, she's going to have to deliver much more because she has, she has to prove that she's going to be different 
than her first um, term, which was a successful term, but somehow she now believes that she just didn't do enough and it wasn't as successful as, uh, as people believe it was. Um, so a Bachelet victory will put more pressure on the tax reform um, than a victory by anyone else. So even if the outside, the outside candidates like Franco Parisi or Marco Enrique Sominami win, uh, they will bring about less change than if Bachelet wins. If Marco Enriquez or Parisi win, the change will be them. Everyone is gonna forget about the Constitution. Who cares about a Constitution if you get a 40-year-old president that's totally new and from outside the system? So if you wanna put your money on less policy change, my take is that Parisi and and, and, and Marco Enriquez are, are there. If Bachelet wins, she's gonna be hard pressed to bring about change because she has promised to move the country to the left and it'll be a big disappointment if she um, doesn't deliver. And, and if she doesn't deliver, it is the left wing that will um, turn against her. If uh, Andres Alamán um, um, wins or, or Pablo Longueira, one of the two Al Alianza candidates, then you're gonna see the kind of gradual reform that, um, that we saw with um, Sebastián Piñera, with some successes and some policies that perhaps were not the right policies, um, but nothing dramatic, um, just as the Piñera administration was not dramatic change from what the Concertación offered um, during the past 20 years. Thank you, Patricia. <laughs> I, do, I, 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 I don't think that if Bachelet is elected president that she, I mean, there will be some pressure, of course, I do agree with, with Pato in a sense, there will be pressure from the left for her to, you know, introduce sweeping reforms, but I think in the end what we're going to have, given, given the constitutional arrangement, given the high quorums you need to do anything, any kind of change, given the electoral system that we have that probably won't be changed, given the fact that we're going to probably have 50-50 in both, in both the lower house and the Senate, um, probably we're gonna have, continue to have piecemeal pragmatic change. Um, maybe with one or two major attempts at reform, but to, to actually, maybe, maybe, maybe you'll be right in the sense that in her discourse, there'll be you know, uh, a lot of talk about major sweeping reforms, but I think in practice, we're probably gonna see similar pragmatic reforms that we've seen in the Piñera government and in the previous Concertación uh, governments. So I, I, I'm not, I just don't think it's, po I, I don't think given the design of Chile's institutions, it's not possible to do major sweeping reform. One, one example, counterexample to that is that after the student protest, high school student protest, there was a constitution reform. There was a reform of the LOSE, and the, but that, that required consensus. So um, any types of reforms that, um, where, where you're going to be able to, to negotiate and reach a consensus with the opposition, um, I, I, I just don't, don't, don't see it happening. Let's see, and I think if Longuero or Alemán win, um, I, would actually, I would actually think the opposite. They probably won't approve that they can do more. Um, and especially there's kind of a, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not, of course, this is all, speculation, but I don't think that we're going to see day. the major reforms. Because again, um, like any election, if you look at it in the United States, at the beginning of a presidential election, all of, most of the proposals and the policies are more, they're talking to, to, the, the, base. to the base, to the base that votes, um, to, the, to the parties and to you know, the unions in the United States and, and whatnot. And then in the general election, they move to the center. So I think once probably Bachelet and Alaman or Longueira moves to the center, in the end, we're going to end up with just pragmatic reforms, which I think are the right path to, to avoid becoming Venezuela. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Gregory. Uh, no, I, 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 I think I agree more with Pato, but I think that it, it speeds up the divisions, though, because where do you leave, where does the right go? You're in a situation like what you had with Clinton, right? Where a little bit, and it's not like the left is going to co-opt the issues of the right, but if the, if, if the left takes upon these reforms and actually pushes, where's the right going to go to define itself? Will it come towards Bachelet? I think the old guard really doesn't want to do that. I think there are younger folks within Renovación Nacional in particular, and Christian Democrats that might want to sort of bridge the gap. But the hardcore Uli folks, I mean, where do they go? And I, so I think that the division is actually accelerated 
which again leads me back to when do these reforms really happen on the social level in Chile? And I think folks have waited for such a long time. And Patricia thinks, well, they can wait a little longer. Things are making progress in a gradual way. And I think he's, you're probably right. They are in a gradual way. But I just think that the millennials, on, on a finishing note, that's the big question mark. I mean, are they really going to continue these efforts? I mean, if Camila gets into Congress, is she going to lead a faction in a way that a lot of folks in this country look at parts of the Republican Party as stopping things? If you don't get what you want, they're going to stop things. I mean, is that what's going to happen? Is she going to work with the communists who are insignificant right now, but could be something at, at least as a nuisance, not to define policy, but just to stop things? I think that's the big question mark. Uh, but I, I would happen to, uh, I, I think what Patricia is saying is right. Uh, I just think that there's too many questions after that happens and that will make it very difficult for Bachelet to make a bigger part of the concertación happy. I think right now they've sort of kept it together. What happens to the Christian Democrats if that happens? What happens to Renovación if that happens? And then what happens to Uli? Okay, thank you. Well, as you can see, what is next for Chile is a very interesting question <laughs> with a lot of different answers, different perspectives, some open answers, yes. And I think that our panelists have addressed uh, most of them very, very well. So I want to thank David Gallagher, Patricio Nadia, Gregory Elacqua, and Carmicha for your participation. I want to thank to the Council of the Americas for hosting this conversation. And of course, I want to thank you for your attention and attendance. So good night and good luck. <laughs>